Welcome back to Music 239, where we continue with our study of the music of China. One of the points that I would like to make starting out today is to get back to the, talking about the dizi, which is the Chinese bamboo flute. We saw it demonstrated the other day, but there are a couple of points that I'd like to make about that instrument. Number one is that culturally in China, that, that instrument was traditionally uh, a male instrument. Whereas culturally in America, it tends to be predominantly a female instrument in terms of the people who play the dizi or the flute. And so I thought I would talk about why that is culturally, historically. Um, I don't really want to speculate about the uh, uh, about in America why there's too many why there's so many uh, flute players that are female compared to male flute players. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cultural uh, things built into that, uh, and, and a sociologist could probably talk about it at length. But in China, uh, there is a story about why most dizi players are still to this day male as opposed to female. <coughs> And the reason goes back historically to the fact that the instrumentalists who played uh, this instrument uh, and other instruments typically were uh, members of the king's consort. Uh, they would be instrumentalists who stayed with the king and were his court musicians. And they would play uh, whenever the king desired some music. And that, that's not only true in China, but in many other cultures as well. But in China, in particular, uh, the, um, the musicians who were members, the female musicians who were members of this ensemble would also be the concubines of the king. And so uh, he, the king did not want to see the faces of, this, uh, of, of these young women covered by an instrument. And so therefore, they had to play the plucked instruments so that the king could see their faces. Uh, and whereas the, uh, the deeds, the instrument that's going to cover the face, um, let the male players play that. And so culturally, historically, that's why to this day, the majority of deeds of players are males in China. Now, uh, another thing about the deeds that I would like you to know is that in 1949, um, <clears throat> its status was elevated. What happened in 1949 in China? <coughs> Communist revolution led by Mao Zedong overthrew the nationalist uh, Chinese. Uh, and where did they go? Where did the nationalist Chinese go? Taiwan. Taiwan. Right. And so the Communist Party took over uh, China at that time. And one of the things they did was to take some of the instruments that had been sort of at a low level of the social hierarchy and raise their status. And the dizi is one of those instruments. So prior to 1949, you would not want your daughter to marry a dizi player. It was not a socially acceptable kind of thing. And so after 1949, uh, particularly when there was a move to raise up the common person to be more important in society, one of the things they did was to take the dizi and move it into the music conservatory, which is where it is now. And so you can go to Qingdao University and you can be a dizi major. That couldn't have happened prior to 1949. So uh, a cultural change brought on by government that took the instrument and changed its social status and therefore made it much more acceptable for somebody to be a player of this instrument in that culture. So here, um, uh, governmental change is making a huge difference in a musical uh, aspect of the culture. And I think it's an important thing to trace. Uh, there are other instruments that are in that same category, but the dizi is probably the most conspicuous one. So uh, just, uh, just a word about that then. We're going to move on today and talk more about uh, the Jiangnan Suju music. Now, uh, where does this music come from? Jiangnan Suju. You see it in your text. What does that mean and where does it come from? Well, if you turn in your book to page 354, you'll find a picture of China. <clears throat> uh, 
and you can see where this particular type of music comes from if you will find Shanghai on your map, right on the coast where the Yangtze River comes out into the sea. And Shanghai is where the Jiangnan Suju music is most commonly found. Whereas some of the other musics that we've heard in this course have come from other places. For example, if you look at it in relation to Beijing, which is up in the north here, we've also talked a lot about Qingdao, and that's found on the coast right here, just opposite South Korea on the coast. But then moving down further south and about midway down, you'll find where the Yangtze River comes out into the sea, and that is Shanghai. That's where the Jiangnan Suju music is located. Jiangnan Suju meaning silk and bamboo music, because that's what the instruments are made of. So as you listen to the recording again of tracks 14 and 15 from CD number three, you'll hear these instruments playing. <coughs> you'll hear the dita, you'll hear an arhu, you'll hear some plucked instruments, you'll hear some instruments that are struck with hammers, like a hammered dulcimer would be, okay, that's the young chin. And all of these instruments are playing the same melody, but each of the players has a slightly different version of the melody that he is playing. And you'll find a picture in your text of the players who are doing this. If you move ahead to that section of your text, on page 376, you'll see a picture of the players all sitting around a table. And it's not uncommon for these players to actually trade instruments as the night goes on so that everybody gets a chance to play every instrument by the end. Everybody knows the tune, but everybody knows it slightly differently. One player might put an ornament on a certain note, decorate it a little bit. Another player might not. And so every player will have his own version of the melody, and they all play them at the same time. So naturally, when you have that many players all playing the melody slightly differently, there's going to be some variation amongst the parts. And that's what creates the interest. It also creates what your text refers to as a heterophonic texture. And that's a term that you need to know regarding this music. Heterophonic texture. Different versions of the same melody played at the same time. Listen to a bit of track 14 again and see if you hear that. So you can hear that heterophonic type texture happening in both. One of the things that you hear on both of these recordings are some little percussion noises being made. And um, one of the instruments that's being played are translated as clappers. And this is an example of them. Taking these uh, clappers and holding them between the fingers so that the index finger is in the middle and then three fingers here and the thumb here supporting the other end. And you can use it to create clapping effects that can happen not only in, uh, not only in, in a sparse kind of way, but could also happen in a very rhythmic kind of way, as if you were going to be reciting poetry. So one could, one could take these, uh, these clappers and use them to accompany a poem, and sometimes uh, Chinese children will sometimes do this uh, to recite poetry, for example, in a, in a special way. What does that mean? Looking for a friend. It's a very famous children's song, isn't it, in China? Yeah, yeah. So um, 
you might see a child or even older adult using the clappers to accompany him or herself in reciting poetry like that. And, uh, but then in, in the uh, Jiangnan Suju music, we heard it being used sometimes to keep time with that ensemble as well. So this is a, a very commonly used percussion instrument in this style. Now, the next piece that you have on your PowerPoint uh, that's on your CD is the music from Taiwan that we heard previously uh, with the Suona Ensemble playing Seven Inch Lotus. But what I didn't talk about before is that there is a vocal song that is used to help the players learn how to do it. And on your CD, the, uh, the first track that you're given with this song is track 15 on CD number three, where you can learn the tune vocally. And it's handled almost the way we might handle solfege. Now, what is solfege? For those of you that have not been in sight singing class lately, solfege is the solmization, the syllables that are used to help us remember the different tones. So we have do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right, to do the major scale. And if you saw the music, the musical, The Sound of Music, you remember the song that goes with that. Uh, and uh, and that's, a, that's a simplified version of, of solfege in, in our society. Now, in, in the Chinese society that we're studying, there is a different version of solfege that is used for this particular song in Taiwan. And you have it in your text when they're talking about this particular uh, song, the, the, the Seven Inch Lotus. <coughs> And in your text, you'll find that on page 380. If you have that handy, you might turn there and take a look. Because all of the syllables that you have in that example on page 380 are like solfege in a Western sense. So in transcription 8.7, you see a transcription of the melody, and then you see syllables underneath it that are used to help remember the names of each of those tones. And so you can learn it in a vocal sense before you pick up your swona and try to play it. And that's what this is, that's this what this is showing. If you listen to track 16, CD3, you'll find the solfege version of this song. So that's not actually going to be performed that way. That's just how the singer is using it to learn the song so that he can then go and play it on the swona. And as you may remember, the swona ensemble playing it together on track 17 sounds like this. And that's the same tune that you heard sung with the syllables on track 16. Everybody recognize it? That's the same seven inch lotus tune. So in this case, the vocal music is being used as a mnemonic device to teach the tune to instrumentalists.
And that's a very interesting part of that culture. Now the scale forms that are used in Chinese music are primarily pentatonic with a couple of optional added tones that your textbook talks about on page 368, transcription 8.3 shows what that looks like. And you can see in that diagram the pentatonic scale in the white notes and then the black notes show the two added tones that are sometimes used and added to the pentatonic scale. But most of the melodies that we have been listening to have been pentatonic so far in this culture. And for that reason, when we get to the test, I'm not going to ask you to list characteristics of Chinese music because pentatonic could go on every one of them. So in this case on the, on the test, you're going to be listing instead the instruments that are involved with the songs that we're hearing. Okay, so that's one of the changes uh, when, when coming up with the next test as we deal with Chinese music, uh, since the characteristics are a little more limited than we've seen in other cultures. <clears throat> there is an exception to this pentatonicism that is really fascinating, though, due to some recent discoveries, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the discovery of the Bianzhong Ensemble uh, that belonged to Marquis Yi. Marquis Yi was a ruler of a small area of China back around the fourth century BCE. And in about 1974, uh, some workers who were trying to level a hill discovered this tomb in which the Marquis was buried along with his entire court orchestra made up entirely of young women uh, and a dog. <clears throat> and uh, your text points it out as an example of conspicuous consumption. Uh, when, when a person can, when he dies, decree the death of his entire orchestra to be buried alive with him, along with presumably, presumably his dog, um, a, a, along with the entire musical ensemble. Um, quite, quite an amazing example of conspicuous consumption. Um, we, we see some of that in today's society, although perhaps not quite so dramatic as that. Um, but uh, that's, another, that's another topic for sociologists and, and not for me. However, I think it's, it's really interesting to look at this set of bells because they were all tuned in equal temperament, 12-tone equal temperament, which really flies in the face of the fact that uh, most of the Chinese music that we hear, traditional Chinese music, is in those pentatonic configurations with the added tones. Here's a set of bells from four centuries BCE that is tuned to all 12 tones as if it were tuned by a piano. It sort of turns musicology on its ear when some discovery like that is made. And um, it's a puzzling kind of thing, but clearly it's an oversimplification to say that all Chinese music is pentatonic, because clearly it is not when you look at evidence like this. Now these bells, you'll see a picture of them in your text on um, page 374. You'll see a picture of the excavation of the tomb along with the bells. That's from page 374, but I also have another picture of them from a composer named Tan Dun from China, a very famous composer who's written some film scores. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've seen Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, for example, uh, Tan Dun wrote the score to that film. Uh, also, uh, many other uh, uh, film scores and, and a lot of concert work. Uh, Tan Dun's probably one of the most famous classical music composers in China. And in 1997, Tan Dun was commissioned to write a piece for the reunification of Hong Kong with the Chinese mainland. And so here's a picture of him next to the bells. I know it's hard to see that. 
with the, with the, uh, with the projection there. But these are, this is the exact set of Bianzhong bells that were unearthed in 1974 at the tomb of Marquis Yi. And Tan Dun decided to use these bells in his piece from 1997. So he had them recorded, and then he used the recording of them when the symphony played the piece. And the Hong Kong Symphony premiered this piece in 1997, uh, the year of the reunification. I'd like to play them for you because uh, uh, I think to get a sense of the sound of these bells that are so many thousands of years old is, uh, is quite remarkable. Uh, so let's listen to just the beginning of Tan Dun's Symphony 1997 to hear the Bianjong. And then the rest of the piece starts. And you start to hear the orchestra come in and eventually a children's choir. And it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an amazing piece. But it starts out with the Bianjong and then they come later back into the piece. So that's how he uses the old in the new piece kind of a remarkable usage there by Tan Dun. <clears throat> okay, also in your text there are some pieces of vocal music that qualify as work songs. <clears throat> First the weeding song and you can find a picture of the folk singer who sings this song in your text on page 369. His name is uh, Jin Winyin, and uh, he sings this weeding song that is then transcribed on the following page in your text. And it's track 312, the weeding song. This would be a work song in the, same, uh, in, the, in the same character as the work songs that we saw in African American music. Music that is used to make the time pass while working in the fields. And one of the things that's very important to do in, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're planting wheat or you're planting rice in China <coughs> is to get the weeds out of those fields. And um, in the days when that was done by hand, this is the kind of song that might be sung. picture of the singer here on page 369 and then on the following page you'll find a transcription of what he's singing and you can see from that transcription that it is not an easy piece to transcribe because there is not anything regular about this song metrically. It's very free because he's the only singer he doesn't have to stay together with anybody and so there is uh, a great deal of freedom to what he sings. And, uh, and, and so you can see that the transcription is, um, is quite varied rhythmically and not at all the motor rhythm kind of thing that we saw, for example, in an African-American work song where they were all trying to stay together 
to keep the work going in a mechanized kind of way. Uh, yeah, the question is, in Chinese music, do they not have 4-4 four, four or a metric kind of design? In some music, they would. And in some, some of the music that we hear is far more metric than this. But because it's sung by an individual singer who is weeding in a field, he doesn't have to stay together with anybody. And so he's not concerned about metric, um, uh, about staying together metrically. So that's a good point. Some music is, this music is not, because it doesn't have to be. Uh, the next track on your CD, 13, is also a work song called Releasing the Horse into Pasture, but the performance of it is completely different in, its, uh, in the way it comes across. When we listen to the folk singer uh, in the weeding song, we're listening to the actual singer sing the actual song that he sang when he was weeding in the field. But in track uh, 13, when we listen to Releasing the Horse into Pasture, we're listening to the young lady whose picture appears in your text on 372, who is a, an excellent folk singer, but she learned this song in school. So this song was taught to her as part of a school music program and perhaps had some of the rough edges sort of refined out of it um, in a managed traditionalism kind of way. So when you hear it, it's a very delightful song to listen to, but it's not anywhere near as arrhythmic and perhaps as authentic as the song that we heard before. And it brings up an interesting dichotomy between the two words, traditional and authentic. You have to think about it. Both of these songs are traditional songs. One of them, however, is probably more authentic than the other in terms of who is performing it and where he learned it and how he learned it. You see what I mean on this? Traditional versus authenticism. Here's track 13. <clears throat> So the question that was asked before about whether some of the songs are more metric than others, this one is clearly more metrically oriented. But is it authentic? We don't know. It was learned in a school environment rather than being learned out in the fields, uh, releasing the horse into pasture or weeding the rice paddies. So we don't know for sure how authentic this is. Uh, but certainly, you can conjecture that the uh, weeding song is more authentic than releasing the horse in this context. Does that make sense? Okay, good, because that whole concept of traditional versus authentic is a very important concept in ethnomusicology from culture to culture in terms of making those kinds of decisions. The next song that you have on your PowerPoint is from the style known as Beijing Opera, also known as Peking Opera. In Chinese, Jingzhu. And this style is a very important style in, in Chinese life. If you've ever been to see Beijing Opera or Peking Opera or have seen it uh, in a video, it is a, it is a highly stylized performance in which the players uh, uh, get into very elaborate costumes, makeup, and, uh, and put on a play that involves a great deal of music. Um, it's been going on for centuries, and it is quite a famous style. We have one example of it in our text, and it is the uh, track 
on your CD, 4-1, third wife teaches her son. So let me line that up for you. Traditionally, Beijing opera would be performed only by men, and the men would also be doing the female roles in the opera. So they would sing in very high voices and would dress up like women and put on women's makeup and look as much like women as they could to perform these roles. Uh, the same uh, style exists in some of the theater of Japan, for example, kabuki. Uh, so you can see that cross-culturally. Uh, but in China, the Beijing opera style uses this. Um, in later years, women have actually played these women's roles. But in the case of the song that we're listening to, you're listening to a, women, a woman sing the song, which was made famous by a man who was imitating a woman. You're listening to a woman imitating a man who was imitating a woman. Does it make sense? You see where it is? OK, so that's why this music sounds the way it does uh, in, in terms of the style of the voice and the way she is singing it. You'll also hear some instruments in here uh, that we've heard before. The clappers, for example, are going to come back. And you're going to hear that kind of sound going on in this music to help to uh, create percussive ambience to the vocal music in Third Wife Teaches Her Son. So at the beginning of that recording, you heard a, a speech style of song because it's actual spoken text that's going on before the music actually begins. And then later, you hear more of a sung kind of text. But realize that it's all being done within the theatrical confines of Jingchu, Beijing opera, a, a very highly stylized kind of theater uh, that is very traditional in China. Let me add one other thing to that uh, regarding Beijing opera. During the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, um, it was decided that uh, only uh, a few model operas would be performed in the Beijing opera style. And these were actually written by uh, Chairman Mao's wife, who uh, wrote very, uh, very politically correct operas having to do with uh, the uh, uh, glorification of the Communist Party. And uh, these were the only ones that were allowed to be performed during this 10-year period. After the, uh, the, uh, the end of the Cultural Revolution, the other uh, styles were brought back. But um, much was lost during that time. And if you want to read up on Cultural Revolution, you can certainly Google that and find more information about it. Now, another song that I would like to bring to your attention is a children's song, Wa Ai Tiananmen, uh, which is very famous in China. Uh, all Chinese children learn to sing this song. And what it does is to help promote the patriotism and certainly the glorification of Chairman Mao, the, uh, the leader of the communist revolution. 
The lyrics, I love the gate of heavenly peace in Beijing, the sun rises above. The great Chairman Mao leads us on the march forward. Uh, part of the lyrics to this song. So children learning songs like this learn basically patriotism uh, for their country and certainly the love for Chairman Mao, which is very prevalent in China to this day. Let's listen to a little of this song and then we'll talk about the ramifications of it. Okay, and it goes on from there, okay? So it's a happy children's song singing about the gate of heavenly peace in Beijing. Where is that? Where is the gate of heavenly peace in Beijing? What is Tiananmen? That's what it means, gate of heavenly peace, Tiananmen. Where is that? Tiananmen Square, where is that? Ah, yes, right next to the Forbidden City in Beijing. In fact, um, here's a picture of Chairman Mao's tomb that is in the middle of Tiananmen Square. And you can, you can see that it's a huge square, lots of buildings around it, some government buildings around it, but on the other side is the entrance to the Forbidden City, the traditional uh, palace of the emperors of China, uh, and that gate that is there is Tiananmen, the gate of heavenly peace. So what's the history behind Tiananmen Square more recently? Student riots, when? 1989. 1989 student protests. Anybody, um, anybody looked at the Google images of those before? Go to Google image. It's a guy standing in front of the tank. Exactly. And you'll find some pictures of the square, the Forbidden City, and those kinds of things. But if you, you scroll down a little further, and you will find some other images of the student protests that took place. And, and when you do, you'll find uh, uh, some of the images that are, that are maybe not so peaceful. Um, so there's a lot of controversy having to do with that. Uh, protests still occur uh, in various places uh, regarding the 1989 uh, massacres and the student protests. Uh, the image of the lone student standing in front of the line of tanks is one that uh, tends to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty powerful, as well as the one involving the Statue of Liberty. Do you know about that too? No. Okay, there was a, they, built a, they built a replica of the Statue of Liberty and put it up in the square. This is stuff that you should research on your own and, uh, and, and learn about because it's important historical information. But here's the question. Uh, so in this case, the song is being used to educate children about patriotism, right? Does that kind of thing happen in America? Yeah. Yes? Can you give an example? God bless America. God bless America, okay. Uh, national, anthem. national Anthem, right, right. All of these songs are taught to children at a young age to try to educate you about patriotic kinds of things. How about the song, This Land is Your Land? Yeah. Is that a patriotic song? Not originally. No, somebody knows the song. You know the whole song, don't you? Arlo Guthrie's father 
Woody Guthrie wrote this song. And so if you go back to your PowerPoint and look at the very next frame, This Land is Your Land was written by Woody Guthrie using uh, a, a religious tune called When the World's on Fire. And it was written during the Great Depression. <coughs> everybody, everybody sing This Land is Your Land. Ready? This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Most of you know that song. Why? Because you learned it in school when you were little. Right. Here's a verse that is not in the fifth grade music book where I learned it. It goes like this. As I was walking, I saw a sign there, and that sign said, no trespassing. But on the other side, it didn't say nothing. Now that side was made for you and me. Whoa. <laughs> this song was work, written in a work camp in the 1940s, and it was performed for people who had no jobs and no homes, who had basically been left destitute by the Great Depression. Now what does it mean to sing to those people, this land was made for you and me? The no trespassing sign doesn't apply to you. Just Take it back. It's anarchy. Woody Guthrie was a member of the American Communist Party. He's talking about this land is our land. This land is your land. Go take it back from the rich people. That's what he's saying in this song. And yet we learned this song when we were in fifth grade as a patriotic song. <laughs> Whoa, what has happened here? Uh, it's been turned around. Why? Because the lyrics involving the no trespassing sign have been taken out. They are censored. Censorship. In a, in a subtle kind of way, that song has been censored. The final segment from our unit on China will be a wind and percussion ensemble from Qingdao University that I had the opportunity to hear when I was there in December of 2007. As you listen to this group, I would like you to look at the instruments that we have studied that are in this ensemble, including the suona, the diza, and the sheng in the front row. And then in the back row, you'll see a variety of percussion instruments, drums, and cymbals that help to create a very festive atmosphere of this music. We hope you enjoy it.